Okay, welcome to Disrupt Ed TV. Hi, I'm Michelle Hill, I'm your host, and this is an episode of Teacher Sparks where I am thrilled to welcome Astrid, also known as Emily Francis, from Concord, North Carolina. So welcome, Emily. Thank you, happy, happy to be with you. Thank you for I, having me. Oh, I'm so excited to have you here today <laughs> because you have such a great story to tell. Can you start you. by telling us when you came to the United States and a little bit about your background? Yes, so I was born in Guatemala and I lived in Guatemala for 15 years. But at the age of 13, my mother decided to make her way from Guatemala to the United States. Um, just so she can send enough money for us to support us. And when I say us, it was me as the older sibling and four of my siblings, three sisters and a brother. So we stayed in Guatemala where my mother made her way here. Um, the plan was for her to go back to Guatemala. The doors began to open and we made our way here to the United States. So I came to the United States at the age of 15. Um, I was enrolled in high school in the ninth grade with a sixth grade education because that was the highest level I had completed. I went through Martin Van Buren High School in New York City. Uh, unfortunately, I was un unable to graduate because I did not complete my high school. I had my high school credits, but I didn't pass the American history test. So long story short, I ended up having to get a GED and for my GED, I got my bachelor's, my master's, and now I am a teacher of English as a second language here in Concord, North Carolina. And I love what I do. I'm passionate about teaching ELLs, that passionate about working with families and teachers. Well, that is awesome. What is the name of the school that you teach at? It is Concord High School. So I taught six years at the elementary school, and this year is my first year at the high school level. So I'm thrilled to be working with students who are experiencing basically the same thing I experienced when I came to the United States. Yeah, you must, you must be a great asset for them and a great resource because you know that journey yourself. I tried. <laughs> yeah. So you told me that you have approximately a hundred students that, that are direct service for ELL, right. um, but you have a group of about 15 students, mostly Latinos? Yes. Yes. It, all of them are Latinos. They have been here in the country less than a year. So our program is called um, ESL for new immigrants so it's just providing the basic of the language for ESL and it's only one period the other three periods those kids are in regular classrooms so and then after that I work with other kids or sometimes the same kids in an inclusion program or a co-teaching service well that's awesome for them that they have that kind of a resource uh, with you so one of the things that I really am a strong advocate for is to develop a culturally responsive school and classroom. And so what does that look like at the school level? Well, we start by creating an environment where students feel comfortable. And when I say students, it's anyone that would walk through the door. Uh, if they come here to enroll, we want them to make sure that they are welcomed, that they are received with a smile, that they feel that they belong here in a school, starting with the office. So it's like a front porch. We make sure that students are welcomed and they feel like they want to be here. And then we move on to our hallways. We need to make sure that our hallways are welcoming our students with hello signs in the different languages. And we also have to make sure that teachers are employing um, strategies to make sure that they welcome students so they can feel that they belong in their classrooms. I love that uh, idea of a front porch and how that must feel when they walk into the central office or the office in your school yes. where they immediately feel a strong sense of belonging. And so what exactly would you give somebody, what, what strategies would you give a central office administration on how they can develop that front porch feel? Well, you know, language is always a plus. I mean, you can learn a hello or hola and, and anything that you can say to welcome uh, the student in their home language. It's always great, but it's not, not, it's not necessary. You know, a smile goes a long way. So if the student and their families are coming in to enroll and they see someone with a smile and welcome them, that says, I mean, it goes a long way. So we do try to make sure that our we have a secretary that speaks Spanish and English. 
So since the majority of our students are enrolling are Hispanic speaking, as soon as they see her, they feel comfortable. It's like they let the guard down and oh, they feel that sense of comfortableness because they have someone that there's no language barrier. There's someone that they can communicate with. So our principal worked very hard to make sure that we have that someone in our office to represent our families. Yeah, that's key um, that you can have somebody that is physically there, but also it's possible that maybe you can have someone that is available by phone or by Skype, um, another method of uh, you know being able to contact them. Um, also brings to the important issue of forms, because often when you are in the central yeah. office, you have a lot of forms that students need to figure out, you know, the parents need to fill out for the students. So yeah. um, I probably would add that to the recommendation to make sure that you have that translated somewhere so that they, they know exactly what it is, what kind of information they need to fill out. Yes, or help the parent. I mean, we can just take the pen from their hand and they have documents with them. We can help them fill it out because a lot of our parents or some of our parents may not be literate in their own language, nonetheless in the English language. So if we help them in that way, that will be another way that they can feel comfortable and welcome. I'm not sure that everybody knows this, but you know, the free and reduced lunch form is available in like 82 languages. Wow. You can download it right off of um, the internet. Oh, that's awesome. Right? And yeah. I, I had to do that for a couple of my ELL students and to send home. Well, that's good. And parents would be aware of what it is that they were filling out and why that was important. Right. That's amazing. That's amazing. So that hallway thing, um, you know, you talked about having signs but you know, murals that look like them, uh, banners from their country or flags from their country, anything that you could do to make them feel like a small you know, yeah. sense of belonging yeah. that this space is for them as well is, is really key. Right, yes. And you know, I've heard someone say, oh, but flags and posters is just, it's too much sometimes. Let's not overdo it. But you know what? It's never too much. When you're coming from a country that you're leaving behind and you're coming into a building that represents the United States, but you come into a building and you see your flag, you see a poster with your home language, that just makes you feel so good. It makes you feel so comfortable. So I will say never, there is no such thing as overdoing it. If you have the chance to put flags and signs up, do it because it helps our family. It certainly does. Another strategy that uh, was really great for us is that the cafeteria would serve ethnic foods. You know, periodically, which wow. really made people feel like, yes. you know, they, they appreciate who we are. And then other students partaking in that were like, oh my God, that's so awesome. And, yes. you know, with commonality and something for them to, to build upon, which is really great. That's as well. awesome. That's pretty cool. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. That's so a definite culture shock when you come from another country and you have to get used to <laughs> the food. <laughs> yes, it is. And yeah. I, you know, the, the other way it works too, because when I've traveled and I've gone to places where they're just tortilla after tortilla, I'm like, okay, and not pasta. <laughs> that's right, that's right, yeah. So, that's awesome. Well, one of the specialties you have is really working with that ELL student for language acquisition. And yeah. often teachers will get that brand new student and they, mm -hmm. you know, they're they scheduled into their classroom and the teacher's like, what do I do? Ah! Yeah, do? <laughs> that immediate um, panic, yes. So what are some strategies that you're gonna to recommend to that teacher on how they can help you help that student with language acquisition? You know, again, going back to the immediate question, what do I do with this student? The panic, I think we need to just start. The panic comes from how do I make my content comprehensible for this student that doesn't speak English. But if we put that guard down and worry about the content later and begin by making a contact with the student, just begin by looking at the student eye to eye and say, I need to get to know you first. You know, once you get to know that student, learn what language do they really speak, their story, what, where have they been? Have they gone to school? If teachers begin by immediately starting by just creating a a communication and relationship with a student, I think the strategies and the way to make content comprehensible comes in a little bit at a time. You know, it just sometimes it feels like, oh, what am I going to do? 
you know, and the research proves that in order for a student to be able to understand content, they need to comprehend it, right? So one of the strategies that we teach here at the school with our teachers is just what activities can I use? So when I teach in English, my students that do not understand the language can really learn something. You know, so we talk about um, a, a, a learning from one another, just having paired them up with someone that speaks the same language, or maybe using vi visuals or using videos or using hand gestures. Sometimes just gestures go a long way. So staying away from lectures and making sure that you're making your content comprehensible goes a long way with students. Yeah, one of the things, and, and I taught world language, so we were working in opposition. You know, we were we were learning uh, a foreign language from English, and it was, the strategies are very similar, which is, um, you know, you make sure that you use a lot of hand gestures or facial gestures and yeah. manipulatives when you could and games and activities. Right. The other thing is, is that you could, you know, I want to give permission to teachers that you can be flexible. I've had teachers say to me, well, we're learning Romeo and Juliet and he's just got to learn. And I'm like, <laughs> you don't have to do it that way. No. You could pick something as a substitute or yes. you could go online. One of the other things that I've done for my ELL students is to go online to YouTube and find Romeo and Juliet, a synopsis of it, but it's, it's, um, you know, dubbed in Spanish. And right. so they get the essence of the story. So there's right. those different yeah. strategies. Yes, and the biggest mm -hmm. one is, is really to just tell them to breathe, to yes. be flexible, and to build that Start relationship. creating first. that relationship, yes, because the student, see the good thing, the plus about creating that relationship is when the student is not really learning anything or getting lost in the translation, the student feels that trust to come. And even, in, even if it's not in English, the student can say, hey, I'm lost. I don't know what to do because that student has that relationship with the teacher. So I think that's foundation is core in order for you to gain um, that entrance where student can learn academic. You've got to start building that trust and relationship. Absolutely. And content becomes secondary. So it's first build the relationship and then I used to say input, input, input before output. So there you go a lot of things in English yes eventually it'll start to make it model mm -hmm. model 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 I was having a conversation with a teacher yesterday just because our students don't speak the language doesn't mean I'm gonna water down my content or my language and I'm just gonna use tier one words because they're just too hard if I use big content words no I think the more rich language that we use the better language that we use the more our students are going to get exposed to that language that we want them to reach right but we have to expose them to that at home there is no academic language yeah. you know it's just that social basic communication skills that they're learning it's in the classroom with the teacher within the students that they're going to hear that academic language that we want to hear from them yeah well you brought up such an interesting point um, that I want to ask you about which what what do you recommend to teachers of ELL students in terms of parental contact or communication because often they're like oh, I don't speak that language what do I do you know because I speak Spanish I don't use resources that are wonderful talking points remind one-on-one -on -one. there is um, this apps that nowadays I dare use it. I don't have to rely on that because I can just pick up the phone and talk to my parents. I just had a parent meeting and I called all of them and I didn't have any communication issues because I can talk to them. But nowadays there are so many apps that you can just text the parent in English and it translates to any other language. So rely on those resources. They're there. So language should be no barrier when it comes to communicating with parents. They need to know that you want that partnership to educate the child because if you just let them know oh what happens at home is at home and at school is a school we're never gonna build that partnership with parents and we need them we need them because when they come home they have homework to do they have assignments to do they have projects we need that partnership so use the resources available 
So yeah, and say. don't shy away from it. Don't exactly. shy away from uh, being in contact or, or putting the information about what their child is to do and see if you can't translate. I'm not a big fan of Google Translate or one of those, <laughs> but in a pinch, it does. It exactly, yes. At least get the message across that Absolutely. It, you know, communicate something versus nothing. So yes, yes. And not assume that parents know because, you know, culture, culturally, education is, is different in, in, in our, you know, different areas. So just because we do it here in the United States, we just can't assume that it's being done in every household. So we need to make sure that parents are aware of any homeworks, any assignments, any report cards. Just let them know, send a message saying, hey, you know, today is the end of our quarter, so just don't assume that our parents know this stuff automatically. So another thing that really um, gets questioned a lot is that if the teacher or the administrator is not a minority, can we connect? Can we can we effectively um, fight for the you know the responsiveness of the school and the classroom for that particular minority student? Um, you know. Some people would argue that you need to have somebody of color, or somebody who's a minority, to do those things. And I just like to hear what you, uh, you know, your viewpoint on that. You know, not necessarily. It, it can be anybody that has that compassion, that empathy toward what the students are going through. It doesn't matter what race or what color you are. You can approach any student and get to know that student, learn their stories, feel that empathy, walk their shoes, walk in the neighborhoods and see what it is to be in their neighborhood. So when they come to you and talk to you, you have that connection. So I don't think Yes, we need to see color because we are different cultures. And I think being that not seeing in color is colorblinded and that doesn't occur in culture. We have to see color. We have to see differences. But when I see a majority, such as a white female or white male approaching a Latino kid and coaching him, and uh, that's just amazing. You know, it makes it look like, hey, we're worth minority needs to step up and just we're worth something so it's good to see that and we have to see more we have to model what we want to see we want to see minority males minority females take positions that only majority are having we need to step it up and say, not when i say we is just professionals you yeah. know as a professional we need to step it up and model what it is to be a professional model what it is to be a good person have that empathy so definitely, you know, principles out there, just because you're not a majority, um, a minority, doesn't mean you're not going to reach out to your local community and talk to our parents. Our principal was here. He is a white male, huge, tall man. You know, my parents might be intimidated, but at the same time, he was there with his computer trying to help parents. You know, it's just no color, no size, no gender when it comes to supporting our students and just loving them just loving yes. them and, and embracing their culture and yes. celebrating it you know that's one of the things that I've always said that um, you know when we look at culture it's not just tolerating one another it's celebrating one another and exactly. diversity is a beautiful thing oh that's absolutely it makes it so great so I want to switch gears a little bit and I want you to tell me about this amazing experience you had with People Magazine that landed you on Ellen. <laughs> Yay! Yeah, it was, it was an awesome article. This article was just so good that I guess he got their producers' attention. From Ellen DeGeneres was one of the shows that, you know, as a 15, 16 year old girl trying to learn the language, you know, looking for shows on TV. There was no one at home to model the English language. So my... TV was my resource. Yes. So Friends and Ellen DeGeneres was one of the shows that I just watch and try to grasp the idea of what was happening because of her energy of dancing. You know, so I watched that show for years and years. And the next thing you know, there's an email from a producer. Hey, would you like to uh, be featured in the Ellen show? I was like, what? You know, at first I didn't believe it. I had to do a little research, but you know, it's, it, it, it was a reality. It was true. I was sitting there right next to her looking eye to eye and it was the most amazing experience. I got pictures right there. Yay! Awesome. <laughs> I hear your school benefited quite generously. 
you know, Chibani founder, yeah, he came through and he heard about my story. He came to meet me at stage and he shared his story as an immigrant, a successful immigrant as well. And he was able to provide a huge grant for our school. So um, Urban Elementary is the school, was able to build a pantry for our kids with um, that need the support and um, ended up getting home with a backpack full of groceries. So it was really cool. Oh, very cool. Yay. <laughs> so, um, so what's next for you? Oh my goodness, I don't know. I'm still, I just started here at the high school. I was like, I feel like I just started teaching all over again. You know, everything is so new for me. Um, yeah, I'm invited to conferences to do keynotes and share my story and just, you know, one of my mottos right now and it, it is, it's, it's not about my success, but it's about what students do because of me. You know, I get to a point that it's not what I become or what show was I on, where was I featured. It's about leaning back and say, okay, this student is doing this, that, and that because of what I've done. So I want to see that. I want to say that. That will be my success. That, that will be your legacy. That's my legacy. That will be your legacy. Yes. So I want to thank you personally today. This has been an awesome conversation. I hope everyone who's watching takes up just one or two of your suggestions and they awesome. help to create a really culturally responsive school or classroom or both. And they invite that um, essence of culture into everything that they do exactly. because it's so important. Yes. And then they remember that we're better together. Yes, and build those opportunities to change a student's life. Uh, any way for people to contact you? Oh, I'm on Twitter. You know me. I'm a Twitter fan. Emily Fran, ESL. You can find me there. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, Emily, thanks so much. And I really so appreciate the wonderful work that you're doing. Thank you. Um, My pleasure. Gusto y nos vemos pronto. Muchas gracias. Okay, adios. All right. Adios. Hopefully, we'll still continue to learn and grow together and um, drop in anything that you want in terms of resources or ideas on Twitter for people to follow because we're all watching. Absolutely. Thank you, Will. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks Bye. so much.